Well, um, you see, the unless courts take up that active role, um, the citizens then will stop going to courts and go to the streets. You see, courts are the ones that separate and maintain that decorum as a nation. That um, as much as we have laws, they're the ones who breathe life into those laws. And so the importance that the courts play is quite great because you remember if you saw some of the comments of the Gen Zs, um, law society ideally every time we have a dispute and we presented our views also on the finance bill 2024 and uh, when they were ignored, parliament passed, we knew the next step was to go to the courts to challenge yeah. um, the act uh, once it was signed by the, the head of state. So that's uh, the process that we normally do. But the comments, even from the Gen Zs and those who are in the streets, they were like, well, you know, why should we go to court and they'll ignore court orders or the court will, will not issue orders against the state? And so that's, that's the hard place that the courts play. They need mm. to be the farm and the last bulwark for the people of Kenya because they are the only ones that can breathe life and put a halt to the kind of impunity that we sometimes see from the executive and the legislative arm because we have also seen um, this, uh, the legislative arm purporting to say that court orders cannot interfere with what yeah. they're doing, that yeah. um, <laughs> they can do whatever they want. So you see, courts play quite an integral role and unless also they take up their space and remain firm then, they, you'll find that uh, we have a judiciary-led executive. <laughs> <laughs> but then, Faith, um, the courts have issued orders. Mm. The courts have, uh, you know, directed, they have issued injunctions and said, do not proceed with this. Uh, this is an order. Uh, come before court and explain yourself. And those have been ignored. What are courts to do? How do courts enforce their orders? You know, you hold the uh, specific command, uh, those in command are, are responsible. And I say this because if you see um, the case that we recently did of the acting Inspector General of Police, it was a clear show of um, court disobedience, ignorance of court orders, but at the end of the day, they had to come to court and apologize and ask for leniency um, after a committal sentence had been issued and the court saw it fit to set aside the same. But you see, if it hadn't gone to that tangent and the court had not been consistent and held firm, um, irrespective of the challenges that the court had raised that they felt that they were under attack, which the law society also came to just speak strongly about judicial independence. If the court hadn't taken that hard stance, then the kind of impunity we would have seen ignoring and proceeding um, to do whatever they want we would have seen. But you see, that's a lesson to show those in power that the court has actually the powers to hold you personally accountable. So that when the court gives um, orders of committal, it's not the office of the IG that will go to jail. It is that individual person who the court has committed that shall go to jail. And so it also reminds individual persons that hiding behind um, that have been given orders doesn't work. Mm. Because eventually the law catches up to you. And the machinery that is the executive, it always comes full circle and somebody always has to take the flak for the rest. Mm. And so it might turn out to be you. And so it gives that um, confidence that as long as the courts are co consistent, we will stand with them, the people will stand with them. And it comes full circle. Those individuals shall be held personal, personally responsible, which sends a message to the rest that you're not above the law. There's a disconnect here, Madam President. The disconnect here is the court knows what it should do. It pronounces itself sufficiently clear. But the enforcers clearly do not seem to understand that when it is issued, they ought to actually act. Yeah. There's a complete disconnect. Mm -hmm. It's like the court is speaking to itself. Mm -hmm. Because... If indeed the police service understood that they themselves were part of this process, then it would, be, it would actually be simple. You could even have an IG being arrested because they have ignored a court order. 
you could have somebody higher being arrested. Now, if this happened, then people would know, you know, these court orders are not things to be trifled with. Yeah. But so long as the police service feel that they take orders from some other source and most definitely not the courts. How do you think we're going to cure this? We can cure this by, you know, let the courts do their work and then block those who are disobeying those court orders from accessing and benefiting from those same courts. You see, they also have to make a stance. You cannot ignore a court order then come back to get another court order for something else. <laughs> you see, it's, you, those who come to equity must come with clean hands. You can't expect me to, you know, here, I've g told you bring this, but you refuse, you hold on to it, then you come with another plate and say, serve me this. And you're pretending, the court also must also stop pretending that they're closing their eyes, that, oh, this is a different scenario. Mm. They must also recognize that they work as, as our entire judiciary. If they refuse to obey court orders, they should not be given audience before those honorable courts. The same executive and parliament is now before the honorable courts mm -hmm. on question of a process that they went through. Mm -hmm. It's a court matter yet. We are waiting for the decision, so I won't get involved in it. But they are actually pleading for the court to see their side of the story and listen to them and, you know, um, that their arguments augur better than the other side. And so if these are the same individuals that are ignoring court orders, then you don't allow them audience to those courts and hold them personally accountable. You see, holding and summoning, we've seen scenarios where the former um, Chief Justice um, Maraga would be summoned before Parliament to answer questions. Why not summon those, the Speaker of both the Senate National Assembly to answer questions mm. before those honorable courts? Because these arms of government, they work independently, but also they work co-independent. They work also um, together. Interdependently. Inter yeah. Interdependently. And so also you assert yourself as the judiciary and summon them to answer because they cannot on one hand say they, they are above, they, they can do whatever they want and then run to, to yourselves to seek audience. It, it's high time courts as well take up their important role and their place and some of these individuals because when they're in that court they are before an honorable court of law they must obey court summons so you're saying that the court should uh, <coughs> basically court a should know what court b and c and d are dealing with well because then you say if if a matter is before court a yeah and it involves for example uh taxation measures and court a has made a determination on taxation measures and then there's a matter in court D on taxation measures and that plea is now coming from the legislature or the executive. Court D should, re, re, should know what court A has done. You know, Even if it's a separate matter, but the way you are behaving in court A, I should not give you audience in court D. Well, if it, um, let's get it right. So if it's both on tax on the similar issues, mm. These, the, the way courts organize themselves, those matters can be consolidated if they're on similar issues or be had before one similar bench if they are concurrent or similar issues that they're dealing with. I would understand a scenario, obviously, if it's totally different matters. But the way the courts work is that, for example, you have refused to obey court orders with regards to um, summoning, um, let's say, the current matter that is still ongoing, let's say the case of um, the MCA Wajiri have refused to um, obey a certain court order, you've been summoned, you've refused to attend. Um, eventually, when they come to you to ask that, or, um, bec because they came back to that same court and asked um, that this matter be struck out, we purportedly found the court bo um, the body. Yeah. Um, the court can refuse to grant any of those orders until you respond to one or two, three issues. Because even before um, an issue of, you know, expelling that matter, you have to bring evidence indeed that body is um, for that particular in individual. But what, I, what in, co in essence we need to think about, even as the courts, is that how can we ensure that we apply pressure to some of our orders. Mm. You see, they have the option of, you know, saying that one, um, this is a court of law. Um, they have refused to obey this court order, but we will um, continue to, you know, just give these court orders that sometimes now are put as papers yeah. and set aside. The courts have the um, discretion as well to issue sanctions 
to those individuals sanctions that they can see can be extended we have adopted this new um system which i find quite dangerous in our country of uh suspending declarations that we give you time yeah. to implement yeah they should think about now uh, uh, doing the same, um, though I don't uh, support that uh, narrative, but doing the same in terms of holding individuals accountable. We saw um, when, I think it was Odunga, uh, when he was a high court judge, issuing suspended orders, um, issuing orders that um, uh, Kinoti would serve sentence. And if he doesn't do it now, when he leaves office, mm. he would still serve that sentence, <laughs> which now, you know, got him scared because he knew he'd leave that office. Yep. And the, somebody, one the next day. one day, he would, he would face <laughs> jail time. You see, and that's an option because you can give orders and say that you will leave that office, but this individual is going to serve jail time. Mm. Or, or this particular individual fines, which are hefty, will be met. You see, it sends a message that you're not just sitting and saying, I am weak, there's nothing I have I can do. I've issued court orders and that is it. Mm. Or the other essence is to refuse to grant them um, audience until they obey court orders. If they are coming back on similar matters or uh, a, a matter that is still live before court. So the courts, as much as they are saying they are activists, um, and applying themselves based on the raising challenge matters that are coming. For us, or from this side of the divide, when we see suspended orders that you nullify, this is unconstitution, unconstitutional, and then you say, we give you one year mm. before, to impl before this order can be implemented. You see, it, it augurs a sense that either you're, you're giving a soft bed for the executive, and the legislature and so who gives a soft bed to the people of kenya mm. so violate our rights until a time that it's comfortable for you to <laughs> regularize it is okay we as the courts are taking into consideration the rigors of you know governance governance and mm. pal and uh, parliamentary um, challenges let's allow parliament to be able to exercise itself so we as the third arm of government also you know we feel that the executive has pressures and so let's give them time to clean up but in that time it's okay if your rights are violated, violated. It, it's okay if you lose uh, money because we are we're giving government time you know as citizens you must understand mm. and so th you see it it augurs against article 10 of the constitution the supremacy of the people so if you're saying you're the neutral arbiter that is supposed to you know give protect that right of the people because the people don't have the power the executive have the power parliament is making laws and from you you see when the um, the movement of the gens is they were not able to stop parliamentarians from passing those laws in fact i saw someone making a joke that um in the impeachment process if um they they purported the argument on social media was that um they were paid so and I'm not saying that they have been paid. So mm. that was the argument on social media. And they were saying, so tell us how much is your value. So we pay you. So we, can, um, <laughs> we can match it. We can match it and have you, <laughs> you know, they'd kick them all out. Mm. But um, the courts also now, unfortunately, because they are not politicians, they're not playing that politics, must have to balance also thinking about the sovereignty of the people. Mm. There has to be that actual... People need to feel, um, as the saying goes, justice must be done, but must also be seen to be done. Mm. When the perception tilts that the judiciary is leaning towards the executive, then Against they the lose people. that legitimacy mm. that they have as a neutral arbiter. And the unfortunate thing is that because we are a country that is, I would say, we, we value that ability to have your voice heard. It brings now the question of, are we allowing polarization of people in this country? Yeah. Because if I cannot rely on you as a neutral arbiter, make that decision and then people accept. It's painful to accept losses or decisions against you. But you swallow and you say, you know, the court considered this. My, my day shall come. My day shall come one day. But if we feel that it's tilting towards one particular side, then you change the dynamics entirely. You know, Madam President, we, we have a Bill of Rights. And one of the things that was happening as this constitution was being written by Kenyans is they were writing it out of the history that they have had with the constitution that they were um, removing. This was the violation and a blatant violation of their rights 
by the state. And that's why all these matters were put in and said, we have a, ju a judiciary that shall serve this way. We shall have a Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights. We shall have all these in institutions that shall make sure that never again shall the people of Kenya feel as if they are being trampled on by their government, by the state. We are there. People have been uh, disappeared by the government or by elements that nobody knows. People have been arrested. People have, um, you know, been charged frivolously. People have turned up dead in many cases. We are there right now where people are missing. People are wondering where are our loved ones. And yet we have a constitution that is so robust. We have a law society of Kenya that's established by law. You know, as one of the things is, yes, you promote the, 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 the profession of, of law, but also the objects and functions of the society are to uphold the constitution of Kenya and advance the rule of law and the administration of justice. I'm reading that from the LSK Act. Um, the objects and functions of the society. Is it something that this law society can do for the people of Kenya to make sure that we head back to an issue, uh, uh, an era where you do not fear being abducted at any time of day well, when you can go to court and compel whatever i don't know you're the lawyers and you're, you're the society to make sure that we don't have this well that we don't have bodies lying at city mortuary over 100 bodies that are unidentified and that's why i see that the law society has played its part even before the disposal of the bodies we went to court um, arising the same and we see there's no proper process that had been put in place and we have sat with the Nairobi County Council um, representatives and the CS um, of, the, of the county to just sit and look at a fair process and the chief pathologist to ensure that bodies are properly identified, marked, tagged uh, for the purposes of there being records because of the you know the resounding fear that um, bodies of those who may have b disappeared would be part and they would be swept under um, to be part of those who are disposed of and so that's something we start to go through together so we and also with regards to moving the courts um, with parties that have come um, to us raising concerns we have been quite active um, taking up matters pro bono on behalf of members of the public and also raising um, constitutional questions before this honorable courts with regards to how a lot of things have been done over the last three four months in this country and so we have done our part the courts must also do our part um mm, well it's, part. it's part of um, judicial discretion because um, the courts make decisions based on ambits of course of the law and the discretion of the judge on the matter that is before him and so as much as um, we are not in control of the court decisions but as law society, we also criticize um, our judges as well, and that's why... Can you I, move outside the jurisdiction of the judiciary of Kenya? Um, the minority tribes, some minority tribes have actually moved out of the jurisdiction of Kenya, where they say that we feel that our government is trampling on our rights. <laughs> if in this particular case you're saying that the government of Kenya is actually not upholding the constitution, well, Can you go elsewhere and say the people of Kenya are being killed, they are being disappeared, they are buried underground somewhere in Shakahola, they are lying in city mortuary and other mortuaries? Well, the implementation of, of those orders will be another thing because you have to bring it back to our court. So, you know, we don't want to do academic exercises of getting declarations. Um, and we don't want to, I believe that in some, in, there are still honorable judges um lords and our, our uh, certain ladies in our honorable courts that can still do their work and uphold the rule of law and so we'll continue to call them out and we'll continue to criticize their decisions um so that they know that they are also up to scrutiny the same way we criticize the executive and the legislative arm we shall also criticize the judiciary because that's the only way that we can have also robust, robust discussions. The only way you know a mind of a judge is through their pen, what they have written at the end of the day. And that's why people must question and also criticize them as well, because that is part and parcel of growth and uh, part of democracy, because we have to raise our concerns and challenges. We might 
um, welcome certain um, decisions they have made and of course reject certain decisions they have made um, but they also must open themselves to be scrutinized and also criticized because that is part and parcel. They hold public offices and by virtue of that, they are enjoying public coffers. They must be accountable mm. to the people of Kenya. So this has to be a continuing conversation. It never ceases. It never ceases. Mm. Okay. Madam President, thank you for joining us. Thank you as well. In the next hour, we'll be talking about that matter of bodies that are lying in mortuaries, in morgues that have to be disposed of. But then, what happens to them? Who are they? How do we ensure that they are properly identified? What do our laws say? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so Come much. Come again soon. Hmm. Faith Othiambo is the 51st president of the Law Society of Kenya. She's been our guest. I'll keep it here for more conversations. Good morning. It's now 9 a.m.